Once again, Nigeria's public office holders are in the eye of the storm. Suspension of the Minister of Humanitarian Affairs and Poverty Alleviation, as well as investigation of the former NSIPA boss, has caused quite a buzz in the media space. But this is not the first time public officers have been accused of getting caught with their hands in the cookie jar. But apparently, the recent cases will not be swept under the carpet. The president has already directed for a thorough investigation into Nigeria's social investment program to reform the relevant institutions, and this is already staring the hornet's nest. Since the return of democracy in 1999, Nigeria has been involved in a series of campaigns against corruption, establishing several anti-graft agencies along the line. But corruption in public offices has remained the bane of development in the country. Several administrations have anchored their campaigns on the mantra of fighting corruption, but seemingly the end is not in sight. Why has corruption become endemic in public offices across the country? Can Nigeria actually surmount the problem of corruption? Tonight we shall be looking at these issues and more. Thanks for joining us. I am Eukaria Clinton. Welcome to Nigeria Today. Now joining me in, uh, to look at the issues around anti-corruption crusade is uh, Mr. Jide Uju, a public affairs analyst. You're welcome to Nigeria Today. It's my pleasure. Good evening, Nigerians. It's always a pleasure having you, Jide. Same here. Uh, okay, Jide, uh, you know, with the introduction, the, the satellite is currently beaming on the Minister of Humanitarian Affairs. We have the former minister being quizzed by the EFCC. And of course, the yeah, suspended uh, minister, Beta Edu, is under investigation. As a matter of fact, the national coordinator of NSIPA is also, you know, Halim uh, you know, also grilled by the was grilled by the EFCC. So what about what is it about this ministry that uh, makes it somewhat kind of tempting you know for those at the helm of affairs? Thank you, Kerian. Um, ministry of Humanitarian Affairs, uh, Disaster Management and Social Welfare happens to be one of the high budget ministry. And when it was established, uh, before it was established on August 21, 2019, mm. by former President Muhammad Buhari, the National Social Investment Program was under the office of the Vice President uh, for some years, 2016 to 2019. And even at that, there were controversies about the handling of the money. And you recall, um, the seed fund for NSIPA was 500 billion. It's, it's the largest in Africa, half a, half a trillion to alleviate poverty. And what we saw was that the, uh, those who are at the end of affairs decided to alleviate their own personal and family poverty while leaving many Nigerians in penury. Uh, I did an article in my column in The Punch where I analyzed this National Social Investment Program from inception. And you see that it's been enmeshed in controversy and corrupt practices. Even when Better Edu came and uh, granted some press interview, he said there are some people in the Empower Project that should have graduated who are still on the project, still collecting the dough of 30000 And the conditional cash transfer, you heard the story of when COVID-19 was ravaging, and students and pupils were at home. The former minister said he, she's still feeding those students and pupils in their homes. And it's not surprising, because when you throw money at issues, without proper accountability and transparency framework, without the monitor and evaluation matrix, it was as if you just opened a charity office. As of 2016, uh, 
President Muhammad Buhari just wanted to do something out of the blue, something that is unique, a legacy project. So 500 billion to alleviate poverty, that was when he was talking of uh, pulling out 10 million people from poverty in 10 years. He felt that the more money he budgets, the more it will percolate. And people were citing an example of dough that is given to unemployed people in, in UK, in Britain, and that we should have something like that. But over the past few years, in fact, um, news report has it that in the last five years, since 20, yeah, 20, 2020, um, uh, the Ministry of Humanitarian Affairs and Poverty Elevation has gotten about over two trillion in budget reallocation. However, it's not only National Social Investment Program. There is NEMA, National Emergency Management Agency, uh, NAPTI, um, uh, Refugee Commission, and one or two others. But the most controversial one has been the National Social Investment Program. Mm -hmm. And there are four components in that. The Empower, the Homegrown School Feeding Program, the support to uh, government um, jeep uh, that's uh, small scale and small and medium scale enterprises that's where you have farmer money trader money and the rest of it so there are about four components but because there was no monitoring and accountability framework from the inception those who are managing the fund saw an opportunity to help themselves let me give you an instance while the NSIP was NSIP then, National Social Investment Program was under the office of Vice President. We saw our Vice President, former Yemi Oshibaju, former Vice President Yemi Oshibaju, going to marketplaces and doling out cash to people. In the 21st century, with our financial inclusion advocacy, where will you be going to give people cash? That opens you to abuse because somebody can collect five times. Mm -hmm. There was no biometric, um, uh, biometric uh, registration of the beneficiary. The payment was not made through the uh, banking system. So somebody can queue, come to the front, collect 10 or 20,000. Mm -hmm and then go to the back and come again and collect another round. Mm -hmm. And even the officers that are disbursing the money, mm -hmm. because there is no transparency and accountability framework, they were just helping themselves to the funds. And that's why you saw this whole issue of 37.1 billion uh, fraud, for which Sadia Umar Farouk is being uh, quizzed, the one that Ali Mashehu, the national coordinator, is being quizzed. They talked about 44 billion. Now, better I do, we are hearing of 585 million that ordinarily she should not have been the one to write that memo to the Accountant General. This is why I said so. There is permanent secretary in our ministry. You are a public servant. Can you write a memo without your general manager knowing about it? So, she, she, there is Alima Shehu, and that 585 million meant for vulnerable people, that's the 25,000 for 15 million now, so that President Inubu was talking about in mm. October last year. That, that, should have, that memo should have come from the Office of the National Coordinator mm. to the minister. And the minister could have minted it to the palm sec. But what did we see? We saw an instance where this 585 million was supposedly, had it been released, would have been paid into the private and personal account of a staff, which is against the financial regulation of the federal, federal okay. government. Okay, uh, Judy, I'll have to stop you here and I'll bring in our next uh, guest um, from the uh, United States. Uh, joining us via Zoom is uh, Reverend David Ugolo, Executive Director, African Network for Environment and Economic Justice. Uh, he's also the Vice Chairman, United Nations Convention, 
against corruption. You're welcome to Nigeria Today. Thank you very much. Uh, no, uh, Reverend David, no, in your recent uh, article, you said something. You said corruption must not pay. Now, how can we make corruption less enticing? You know, it does appear it's becoming so attractive, so lucrative. How can we make it less enticing? Okay, it's like uh, we have a little uh, network uh, issue there. Now, uh, uh, Judy, you heard exactly what I, uh, I asked uh, him there. We, you know, it's been quite um, uh, a, a very lucrative venture for uh, public office holders. So is it that there, there are no enough deterrent, you know, no enough punishment, you know, for these uh, activities, these corrupt uh, practices? Exactly. There is no two way about it. So recall that under Buhari administration, in the eight years of Buhari, aside from those two ministers that resigned, uh, former minister of environment that went to the United Nations, and one other person who voluntarily resigned, uh, only two ministers were sacked by Buhari in eight years. And they were just dropped quietly. That was the former minister of agriculture and former minister of power. But what happened to them? So when you, when, you, when you have not broken the culture of impunity, when there are no consequences for bad behavior, it will continue to, people will be encouraged to do more. After all, it's, it's a sharing formula. Uh, and so people will just look at it that, okay, let me still march so that I can buy my way through. Mm -hmm. And that's why you see people, even when they have been, you had uh, Sadia Faru, mm -hmm. when the FCC said she should come last Wednesday, she said she has arthritis that she cannot honor the invite, that they should give her three weeks. Arthritis is something that is common. But... She wanted to use that alibi, and we are hearing all manner of stuff that they are trying to do plea bargaining. There are those who said some money has been refunded. Okay. But the point is, why don't we prevent? But th th these are just prevention uh, speculations. Is, I, I've, I've said that there are there are, there are rumors. rumors. We are not uh, uh, yes, them. that 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 there was an uh, uh, attempt at plea bargaining, and that the uh, issue has not been thoroughly investigated. So, the only way corruption will not pay is if you and I engage in it and we are caught and we are punished. But if we can buy our way through, others will attempt it. Life is all about taking risk. So, the culture of impunity that we have not been able to break is why corruption continues to pay. Thank you very much, Ajide. Uh, right now, we would uh, uh, take a break now, listen to uh, some Nigerians on their views on how to tackle corruption in public offices, as put together by Kemini Williams. Don't go away. So I think governments need to set aside from EFCC, ICPC, a committee that will monitor how things are done in each ministry. Once the civil servant do not agree with the politician, the politician can do nothing. The politician cannot do anything except the civil servant agree with them. They, sometimes the civil servant are even the one that will even educate the politician. This is the way to go. This is the way to go. And this way to go, they are showing the politician is the wrong way. And the politicians be what they are. Anything goes. As far as our own politicians in the, in the side of our country are concerned, anything goes. So that is the way it is. The civil servant are the people that the, we have to deal with first. We have to clean the civil service first. But this is not the first time. We've had uh, issues like this in the past. So it's, uh, it's, not, it's not a new thing. Mm -hmm. That's why I said the government, they know what to do and they should take the right action to convince uh, citizens 
that yes, they are really fighting corruption. So is, if the constitution will actually make a law whoever steals should be killed, is the only way for Nigeria to move forward. Welcome back. This is still Nigeria Today and we're looking at the issues around corruption in public offices. And I have here with me two gentlemen, one via Zoom and of course one here in the studio. Now, uh, Reverend David, now, uh, recently when you were you know, elected as the vice chairman of the UN uh, uh, Convention Against Corruption, you made a statement. You said uh, that stakeholders, you know, you said stakeholders in anti-corruption network uh, should work together to block all leakages in government of Nigeria to ensure resources are made available for development and, of course, the victims of uh, corruption. Now, the question now is, how can this be achieved? Given that uh, uh, as some experts have said, corruption is. Uh, is, is an organized crime, is systemic. Uh, and again, they've also accused some of the stakeholders as being part of the system, the corrupt system. So how can we achieve uh, this? Thank you very much. Again, uh, I want to thank um, NT for this opportunity to join this conversation, particularly against the background that uh, in the last few days, we have seen a, a kind of grand corruption uh, going on in the country. Uh, money made for poor people uh, is now being traced to political elites, which really is unfortunate. But I'm happy that uh, the president has stepped up actions to ensure that this does not continue. Like my colleague rightly noted, the culture of impunity is something that continues to reinforce and the need for corruption to thrive and for us to address the corruption. I think we need to look at um, the whole idea on who is victim of corruption. I think this is area that is missing in the whole conversation in the country. So when government is being called upon all the time to tackle corruption, um, I think and that's one of the reasons why I stated earlier on that stakeholders, who are the stakeholders? The victim of corruption. We need a new definition for corruption. Because when you talk about corruption, is we are all victims. And if the victim know that uh, this corruption we are discussing and looking for solution for it, it will become easier. But you know, when you define corruption as public sector, uh, problem. The poor people in our villages, in our country, probably will see it as government problem. But if we begin to see corruption as a problem for all of us, then that brings in the stakeholder and the victim. And the victim need to take responsibility in ensuring that they can address this problem. And if you look across the country today, who are the victims? If you look at the corruption that we're talking about today in the humanitarian ministry, and uh, the one that has happened in the social investment agency. It is the very poor that, has, uh, that are the victim. How do we mobilize them to become stakeholder in addressing the problem? I think this is the real key issue. Because when you see a situation where government officials, the elite, who are actually beneficiary of these grand corruptions, they are the ones also looking for solution for it. Like our local parlance, if you keep money with somebody who is a criminal, it becomes increasingly difficult for the criminal to steal the money. So our key government officials must also realize how they can play a major role and then our people. So the concept of victim of corruption needs to be put on the table. And that's the only way we can begin to see stakeholder engaging in this whole process. Because otherwise, if you look at the trend of corruption in the country, it is political elite, and they are very powerful, they are very connected, and they, co they control the judiciary, they control the law enforcement Okay, Re Reverend David, now, sorry to cut you short there, you said that, that um, uh, you, you have to uh, engage the poor to be part of the fight against corruption. How do you engage these, uh, the, the victims you just mentioned to be part of the fight against corruption? To also be reformed to allow 
um, victims to take responsibility. For instance, I give you an example. Just recently, Glencoe is a multinational, international commodity company that um, compromised almost about eight African countries. And in that eight African countries, they uh, bribed government officials, including Nigeria. And those officials we identified to be mem uh, staffs in NNPC and others. Now, those officials are very powerful government officials. You don't expect those officials to be prosecuted when they are politically connected. And this is the real huge challenge. And so what I'm saying is that who are the victims of this corruption? This corruption we are talking about in the humanitarian office today, humanitarian ministry today, the victims are the very poor. How do we mobilize them? During election time, who do they vote for? Because it's, because you look the power that being, it is the poor people that goes to the election to vote. Whether the election is compromised or not, what I'm saying is that to look for a long-term solution to the problem of corruption that we face in the country today, we must begin to mobilize the victim. The victim will see it. And so what it means is that we must give a new definition to corruption because corruption is what affects you and I affairs the common people across the country. But if you look the corruption definition from um, Transparency International, like a public sector problem, the poor, who are, how many people are in the public sector in Nigeria? But the, the, the corruption that the public sector perpetuates in Nigeria, in part, almost 60 to 70% of the poor in Nigeria. So what I'm saying is that until the victim of this corruption begin to mobilize until we begin to raise awareness for the victim to understand that the idea the elite try to give religious coloration, ethnic coloration, whenever they are caught in corruption, will be avoided. And that's what I'm saying is that if you look what has happened in this regime, it's less than six months now, um, President Tinubu also identified fighting corruption as one of his cardinal goals. But the problem that is missing from his approach is that he hasn't been able to send the body language that he will not be able to achieve his political agenda if he doesn't tackle the issue of corruption headlong. You can see now that in less than six months, a minister appointed by him is caught in this whole oh, shameful uh, transaction, which again sends a very wrong signal about the regime. So in moving forward, because instead of lamenting, I, feel, I strongly recommend that President Tinubu should come out with a strategy because he hasn't put a strategy on the table. He's still relying on old traditional way of fighting corruption. That's not the way forward. He should have a strategy and then also try to follow a modern way of tackling corruption by putting in place an anti-corruption champion. Somebody that he will be outside his political party. Because what has happened is in the sense that if you look at all the people that are involved in the corruption, whether, whether the minister or the agency, they are all members of APC. They all work towards making sure that Tinubu was elected. And they have this kind of entitlement. And that entitlement is the problem. Thank Until the government much, tried to put uh, in Reverend place David. an anti-corruption champion that is not part of the APC. Thank you. Th thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. David. Quite a lot of things to say there, uh, 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 Mr. GD. But, but then, uh, well, uh, this is where we'll wrap it up on this, on this episode of Nigeria Today. We'd like to thank our guests once again for you know, sharing their thoughts with us. A very big thank you to Mr. GD Ujo, a public affairs analyst. Thank you so much for thank your you. thoughts and your time. And also, uh, thank you to Reverend David Ugolo. He is Executive Director, Africa Network for Environmental and Economic Justice. Thank you for being part of the program. And thank you for being part of uh, Nigeria today. Don't forget the program airs every weekday at 7.30 p.m. on NTA News 24. You can also watch this and other episodes on www.youtube.com slash NTA News 24 Hub. Once again, thank you for watching. I'm your carrier, Clinton. Goodbye.